All right, how we doing, folks? Let's try it again. We're all good? Yeah. yeah. Good, good. I am uh, honored to be here with you this evening. I want to thank some folks before we get started. Dr. Cliff Lee, first and foremost. Um, yeah, we can shout him out. Let's give him a shout. Thank you. Yeah. the opportunity on occasion to come into contact with really, really, really sharp, committed, competent uh, students. And I have to say, Dr. Lee was one of those students. From the very first time I met him, I really uh, appreciated his, uh, his passion, his commitment for issues around equity. So you all are fortunate to have him here. And I want you to take full advantage of him and support him while he's here, right? Good guy. Thank you very much. For You see a lot of your former students. Mark Batista here is one of my former students. Give yourself a shout out, Mark. Thank you very much for supporting this. And I want to thank the students for being here. I want to start by really talking about the sense of urgency around some issues that are tied to race and, and class and culture. Uh, Dr. Lee said it best when, when he talked about the fact that how do we respond to the challenges of our time. What I want to spend my time talking to you about today are, is one of the, I think, one of the bigger challenges of our time that we don't talk explicitly about. Uh, and I think we know it exists, but we want to act as if somehow it will go away. Issues of race are always, and have always been salient in our society. Uh, part of what we've got to come to grips with is the fact that the more we choose to not have critical focus and dialogue around race, the more our racial divides will become more prevalent. So part of what I want to impress upon my aspiring teachers, uh, my aspiring counselors, uh, and everyone in the room is that there's this big dialogue that we've got to have around race and ethnicity uh, in particular, but I think we oftentimes try to embed it in some other issues that are tied to class. So I want to kind of walk you through some of the challenges we have. Then I want to pay particular focus on what I'm referring to today as a forgotten population. And I'll tell you a little bit more about who that forgotten population is in a second. So part of what we have to recognize is that race and ethnicity in California is real. Uh, part of what we know, and, and we have known this for some time, and I don't want to bore you with a lot of statistics, but part of what we know is that this state has been one of the most racially diverse states for some time. Uh, what we know is that uh, from data from 2011, 2012, it tells us that basically three out of four, three out of four students who we enroll in California schools are non-white. Uh, and that number is only going to increase. Uh, what we do notice is what happened this year in the U.S. for the first time, 2014, 2015, marked the first time in the nation's history that we enrolled more non-white students than white students. Say that again. We've enrolled more non-white students in the country's schools than we have white students. That is not going to change. Given current demographics being the way that they are, if we don't come to grips with this issue around racial and ethnic diversity, we are walking around with our heads buried in the sand. I oftentimes go to schools and I ask teachers or I ask administrators, what do they do around issues of diversity? I was at a school district last year and I talked to the principal. I said, tell me what you're doing around diversity. And out of story, he told me, he said, well, we dealt with diversity last year. This year we're doing it <laughs> We cannot have this approach that suggests that diversity is a one-time, one-year kind of thing. It is a permanent part of our reality. Part of what we have to understand is that the diverse makeup of who we are is supposedly, is what they tell us, is what makes us unique as a state and as a country. However, part of what we have not come to grips with is that though we are diverse as a state and a country, uh, we have not come to grips with the different kinds of outcomes when it comes to educational opportunities. And that's what I want us to have this conversation about, because despite the fact that we become more and more diverse, we have data upon data upon data that tells us that there are some desperate outcomes for a different group of students. So I said I wouldn't bore you here with statistics, but you just got to just bear with me while I help to build this case, so I can kind of help remind us of why the task we have before us is so critical. So I am a former teacher. I'm a teacher at heart. I, I, even when people meet me today and they ask what you do, I say I'm a teacher. I taught in Compton schools for a number of years. So I am always concerned about what happens in classrooms, what happens in schools. And I am that person because I know how much schools had an impact on my life. And I, I, I am remind, I'm always uh, remiss to not recognize that I am here today because of the critical role that educators play in investing in who I am. Uh, despite the fact that I grew up in a community in Compton, California, where it is oftentimes, it pains me to say, uncommon for young black and brown men to graduate from high school 
let alone to go on and earn a college degree. So I'm always indebted to those educators who never stop believing, who always told me that I could become something bigger and better than what society says that I would become. So as a teacher at heart, I'm always curious about what is happening in schools. How are we ensuring that we're putting the best and the most highly qualified teachers, administrators, and school counselors in every school, but especially in those schools that have the greatest needs. So what I oftentimes look at when it comes to data, I tend to look at a couple of areas. One of the key areas I look at when I see how well a school is doing, I want to see reading scores because what we know and the research tells us is that if you look at where students are when it comes to reading proficiency, we can almost predict and almost project how well those students are going to do, not only academically, but how they're going to do for the rest of their entire lives. That is just the kind of impact that literacy has on young people. And part of what we know today is that more and more data is telling us that certain students are falling behind early. Uh, and so what we've got to do is figure out how do we have some interventions early on in the process to ensure that many of our students have a fighting chance for academic success. So I want to kind of give you just a snapshot of reading and math proficiency in the United States. And I want to do it specifically with the, with the population of young boys because much of my research recently has been focused on our young men in our schools. That's not to say that the issues pertaining to our young women are not much better, because now we have lots of data showing that their, their issues are almost on par with some of our young boys. But part of what I want you to lock in here is on just the, the, the right side of the table, where we look at reading proficiency in grades four and eight. This is the data that comes from uh, the NAEP data, and it really paints a dismal picture. When you look at reading scores for white, black, Latino, Asian, and Native American populations, uh, if we were to look at just our white students alone and look at where reading proficiency scores are for white males, it would tell us that we have only 41% of young white males are reading at grade level by grade four. That in and of itself is a huge problem because what it would tell us is that there's over 50% of young white males who are not reading at grade level. And we can begin to project and predict what their outcomes are going to be. However, when you start to go a little bit further into the numbers, a more distressing story comes about. You look at our black and brown males, and those numbers are, to me, just outright tragic. The fact that we're talking about less than 20% are reading at grade level by grade four. And I, I'm a former elementary school teacher, and I say by grade four, we have stopped teaching children how to read at that point in time. By the time the students are in fourth grade, we are doing what? We are reading to learn, not learning to read. So when you look at where we are at grade four, 80% of black and brown males are not at grade level. You can almost predict where they're going to be. Now, the numbers on Asian American students has always been misleading. And I have been one of a, a handful of folks who are saying that we've got to do a better job at disaggregating the data on Asian American students. Because when you start to drill down a little bit further, what we see is that there are three groups of Asian students who typically do well in the US. Can we name those three groups? Chinese, Chinese Japanese, Korean students, right? When you disaggregate those three groups out, you take them out, you begin to look at the experiences of Cambodian, Vietnamese, Filipino, you see that those students are not very different from where we see our <coughs> black and our Latino students. So part of what when I say males of color and our black and brown youth, I'm referring primarily to Latino, African American, and by large Southeast Asian young men. So when you talk about 80% of this population is not reading at grade level, we can predict how they're going to do in math, how they're going to do in science, how they're going to do in social studies. We can predict everything moving forward, right? So that's why we've got to figure out how can we get literacy scores up. I mean, I'm not a reading person, but the more research I've read, the more I've spent time in school, it becomes paramount to stress that if you get young people reading early on, you give them a fighting chance in life. Can I stress that enough? Reading alone begins to give us a direct projection in terms of where our students will be 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the line, OK? So there's a, there's a, there's a sort of a, a, a unfolding that takes place in our schools. Uh, when our young people fall behind in areas such as reading, it tends to lead to a set of other circumstances that begins to tell you how life unfolds for them. So what we know is that these same group of students, young black and brown boys, who are the ones who fall behind in reading, are then the most likely to be suspended and expelled from school. Uh, the levels of disproportionality are just outright stunning. Uh, there are a number of school districts across the country who are suspending and expelling young boys of color at rates that are outright just, in my mind, criminal, right? Which is oftentimes the next step for far too many of them, right? 
Uh, I was in uh, Delaware just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, a number of districts in Delaware are now under consent decree. They have been intervened by the U.S. Department of Education, Office of Civil Rights, and said you cannot have 25% of your population be black and brown males, but yet 95% of the students that you expel are black and brown males. How does that happen? This is the conversation around race we don't want to have. Many teachers say, I don't think about race when I extend to you. I just look at behavior. We've got to begin to change that paradigm because race is a big part of this equation. Implicit bias is real. Racial privilege is real. These issues are a big part of our reality in school. And if we don't have a conversation about them, we will continue to push out a big segment of our population. So what we know now is that we see a large overrepresentation of black and brown boys and girls who are being suspended and expelled from school. The research tells us that if a student is suspended or expelled just one time, that he or she has a less than 20% chance of graduating on time. So you can begin to project what's going to happen. Again, it's about prediction and projection, okay? So this is the population I'm talking about that's oftentimes forgotten. A recent report came out just this past April from the Office of Civil Rights. They looked at the number of young students who were being suspended in kindergarten. Kindergarten, we're talking about students who are, what, five years old found that young black and brown boys represent 70% of five-year-olds who are suspended from school. I don't know what you can do as a five-year-old to get suspended. I mean, at five, you're supposed to create habit, right? That's what we all did, right? But part of what we have to recognize is that this, this demonizing of certain population happens early, it happens often, and it has some dire consequences on what we see happening with a number of our young people. So, then what happens? We have what, refer, what I refer to and a number of other scholars are talking about the criminalization of males of color. And I want to kind of help set the context to show you the severity of what we're facing and then respond to uh, 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 ways in which we can address that. So part of what I want you to understand is what we know is this. In 2012, males of color comprised 22% of the total number of children under 18 in U.S. schools. So you have to keep this number in mind because ideally what we want to see is some degree of consistency with the overall percentage of this population and how they are affected when it comes to other areas in our society. So 22% of the students in our nation's schools are young boys of color. Yet they make up 62% of all school-aged children who are arrested. You begin to see the disproportionality kick in quite early and often. Furthermore, there are 60% of the cases that are in juvenile court. 85% of youth who are in juvenile detention are black and brown males. And then we think about the fact that 80% of the cases that are waived to the criminal court systems are 80% black and brown males. I raise this question because we have to ask how is it that 20% of any population that represents 80% of folks who are involved in the penal system how does that become a normalized part of our society, right? How does that become normal practice? How does that become sort of business as usual? If we don't start asking some important questions such as why, how, what we do to stop that, we are more or less just spinning our wheels not making any progress. So part of what we have to recognize is the role that we play as educators in creating a set of circumstances that make these kinds of realities common practice. I share these data in a lot of school districts across the country and folks are not surprised. And that's part of the problem. When you look at the disproportionality being what it is, and folks see it and they're not surprised, that means we have become accustomed to it. Where it no longer upsets us, it no longer angers us, we just say this is what we're supposed to do. We have got to begin to push back on this, given the fact that we're talking about some of the largest segments of our population are situated right here. Now, there's a larger context I want you to understand here. There are folks who talk about post-colonial domination and that these kinds of occurrences are part of a larger set of practices that have been put in place for years and years and years. Uh, part of what Michelle Alexander in her book, which I think everyone should read here, The New Jim Crow talks about, is the fact that there's this hegemonic control. People who control institutions and structural arrangements that almost make it seem as if the structure is set up against certain populations from the outset, right? So we have to understand and study pre-service teachers how hegemony plays itself out in schools, how it plays itself out in the larger society. This discursive reproduction of power and knowledge. What do we teach? Who do we teach it to? Whose knowledge is most important? Part of what we hear from young people every single day is they tell us that school does not work for them. 
what we see is we have close to 1.5 million people in this country, young people, who drop out of school every day or who are pushed out of school. When you lose that many people every single year, 1.5 million, somehow, some way, that population is telling us that what we have done in terms of how we set up schools no longer works for them because what we're expecting them, we're expecting them to learn, how we're expecting them to somehow process and make sense out of the world does not fit their reality. So we have to understand what Alex Rios calls this youth control complex, how we tell young people how to act, how to think, how to communicate. When they don't do that, then they become the problems. One of the most fundamental questions that young two and three year olds start to ask when they first start to ask questions and start to begin to speak, what's that one word that they always ask? Why? Why? There you go, right? What happens is young people come into the world curious, wanting to know why. And we value that curiosity, and we encourage that innovation when they're two and three and four years old. But why is it that when they become 10 and 11 and 12 years old, 14, 15 years old, and they ask why I have to learn this, they become a problem. Why is this what I have to learn? And they become a, they become a problem. Why do we have to always read textbooks that talk about experiences that don't fit my reality? When they begin to ask why in high school, then they become a problem. So part of what we have to understand is that the structure of education policy and practice in many ways begins to marginalize large groups of, of students in our society, and when they don't do well, we blame them for being victims of their own undermining. That's what we've got to change. And when overwhelmingly these groups are black and brown, the issue of race has got to be a part of this conversation. Now, let's talk about prisons. Let's talk about profits. Let's talk about how once we push out young people, there's a place that's waiting for them with open arms. And it's not St. Mary's. It's not UCLA. It's not colleges and universities. What we have to understand, folks, we are in the state of California, where one of the fastest growing industries in our state is prison construction. And we're not just talking about publicly built prisons, we're talking about privately constructed prisons. Because most of our prisons in the state system are busting at the seams. We can no longer incarcerate enough young people. So now, what folks have done, they said, well, if you can't incarcerate them, guess what? We'll build our own prisons, and we'll make this, and we'll incarcerate them for you. So now there's a huge industry here in our state. In many ways, we lead the nation in terms of how private prisons are a staple of our economy. So if you look at a 2010 report from the Securities and Exchange Commission, they state that, quote, the demand for our facilities, referring to private, prop, private uh, prisons and services, could be adversely affected by leniency and conviction for parole standards and sentencing practices. So I want you to understand the gravity of that statement. So these private prisons are saying, look, we're in this not to rehabilitate necessarily. We are in this to turn what? Profit. Profit, right? And so we cannot turn profit if schools are in the business of giving lighter sentences. We cannot turn profit if schools stop pushing out children. We cannot turn profit if you keep kids in school. So what you have to understand, uh, uh, folks here, is that look, part of what we do when we push children out, we help to create a huge industry that only profits off of their misery and suffering. That's the part we have to understand here. So now we have, look up, I mean, you can look up Corrections Corporation of America. Wackenhut, these are all private prisons who are making billions with a B of dollars off of the back of young black and brown young people. I want you to understand the school to prison connection. It is all too real and oftentimes it's educators who are priming the pump by pushing students out, by saying students don't fit, by saying students don't belong, and then say you are the problem, not the structure in which we live in, okay? Now, in 2010, the two largest private prison companies alone received nearly $3 billion in revenue. Currently now, we are sending about 6% of our state prisoners to private prisons, with that number expected to double over the next five years. So this is a trend that is not decreasing, folks. It's increasing, right? So part of what I'm having to understand, we're talking about young people here between the ages of 11 and 18. Part of what we have to understand, when young people are coming to us, asking for schools to be places that affirm them and help them to recognize their full potential, but yet still we set up school in such a narrow and defining way and it tells them that they do not fit, we push them out, and then there are prisons and jails that are all too happy to take them on. In the state of Florida, the Corrections Department has worked with the Education Department on a number of initiatives, and one official said that what they consistently do is they project 
the number of prison beds that they will need by looking at third grade test scores. Think about that, right? We will know how many prison beds we will need in the next 10 years based on how well your students are reading or not reading when they're eight years old. Eight years old. So we have to understand the severity of what we are facing. We have to understand the, the seriousness of this problem. And we have to understand the sort of the way in which we have racialized crime in this society. There are all kinds of, of data that show that what we see is a two-tier standard. People of color engage in certain kind of behavior, and they are punished in a much harsher way than their white counterparts are. That's why we have to have the conversation about race, because we cannot act as if justice is blind, because justice is not blind when it continues to have one standard for folks of color and another standard for white folks. It cannot happen, okay? So let's kind of unpack this a little bit further. In Pennsylvania, Judge Mark Chia Ravella was found guilty in February of racketeering for taking a million dollars in kickbacks from the builder of a for-profit prison for juveniles. So what happened here? We have a number of judges who are waiting trial where they are working firsthand with for-profit prisons. Please hand us down harsher sentences. We give you financial kickbacks. Understand the connection here, okay? We cannot keep the industry churning if we don't have enough bodies. So now prisons are giving judges hush money, money to say, send more young people our way. This particular judge was known to send young people to prison for things such as just being in possession of drug paraphernalia, stealing a jar of nutmeg, and posting web page groups about an assistant principal, and were given harsh sentences, some of them as young as 10 years old. 10 years old. Part of what I'm asking my teachers to think about is why do I send young people out of my classroom, right? Part of what, I, I just had a, a meeting just last week with a group of principals, and these principals say that they can almost predict on notice when teachers will begin sending students to the office for the most minor infractions. The most minor infractions. Student comes in, has a hat on, to the office. Student comes in, his pants are sagging, to the office. Student comes in, he forgot his homework, to the office. Part of what we have to understand, this, these sound like small steps, but they start the process of labeling students as being problematic. Student then is sent to the office, a referral is put in place, students are either suspended in school suspension, out of school suspension, you're not in school for three days, now the label is placed on a, on a child and it's oftentimes very difficult to be removed. Right? And part of what we don't understand, and when we tell students they're suspended, they go home, parents are working. So what's that child doing that time that he's off school for three or four days? Right? My great grandmother used to say that what? Idle time is the devil's workshop. When there's nothing at your disposal constructed to do, kids will be kids. So we have to understand, we've got to keep young people in schools, in classrooms, okay? So now, we have a juvenile system in the United States with the highest youth incarceration in the world. We approximately, we approximately incarcerate 7,000 youth per day in this country. And I'm in Los Angeles County where we have the nation's largest detention center. Largest in the nation. We have gotten so good at incarcerating our young people, it is outright just, again, just, just, just disheartening to see. And so part of what I want to talk to you about today is how do we begin to respond and how do we push back. Part of the reason why this is so near and dear to me now is because, again, I think about my own youth and the young people I grew up with, and I oftentimes say the slightest twist of faith, slightest twist of faith, and I would not be standing up here before you now. I've got lots of, of, of young people, well, not young people, because we're not young anymore. I've got lots of old folks my age who could be here, and I could be where they are behind bars, right? Because all it requires is just being in the wrong place at the wrong time under the wrong circumstances, and many of you in this room would not be here. So part of what we have to understand is that this system is moving full steam ahead and it is taking up too many of our young people. I spent close to four months this summer in a number of our youth detention centers in Los Angeles. And it will bring you to tears to see the young talent that is being wasted, the young talent that will never be recognized. This is our forgotten population. Once these young men find themselves in the detention center process, they get released, Trying to get back on track with school is difficult. Trying to get reconnected with communities and families is, is, is a challenge. Many of, these youth are, many of these youth are foster youth. So then you can get to issues of placement. So we have to understand that if we don't serve this population well, what happens is we have the highest recidivism rate in the country in California. 
80% of young people who, uh, who commit a crime once typically commit another crime within the next three to four months. Understand this happens early and often. It pains me to walk onto many of these camps and see young boys and girls, 10, 11, 12 years old. 10, 11, and 12 years old, and we've already kind of set the agenda on what their lives will look like. So, part of what we have to recognize, we have a punishment model in our schools and our larger society that we have to begin to disrupt. Can't be about punishment, because what we have to understand is that punishing children then feeds into the economic model that we have in place, where we continue to profit off the misery and the pain and suffering of our young people. And part of what we do not understand, this final point here, is that what we see is that many of our young people who find themselves in these situations are in need of support help, mental health, mental, mental health services, social emotional services that are not in place from the outset. So we have young people who have less than ideal circumstances who are trying to make sense out of them, but because we don't put the supports in place, they begin to engage in behavior that shows that children are asking for help. So as opposed to us supporting these young people, we penalize and punish these young people. The system we have now says it's about rehabilitation, but if you spend any amount of time in these camps, you ask the simple question, where is the rehabilitation? Why are young people here angrier than they were when they came here in the first place? So we have systems in place that are not concerned about helping young people become whole. In some ways, they're doing just the opposite, okay? Now, in response to this, I'm going to talk to you about the Children's Defense Fund and its Freedom Schools. Uh, the Freedom Schools are a program that have been in place for close to 30 years in this country. Very few people know about them. I encourage you all to go to Google and look up California Defense, I mean, uh, Children's Defense Fund Freedom Schools. One of the best Freedom Schools models are right here in Northern California. We've worked with them for the past four years. Their objectives are pretty clear. They deliver high quality academic enrichment. They have a direct focus on literacy. They promote intergenerational servant leadership development. They support nutrition, health, and mental health. And they develop social action and civic engagement. The program is one that is designed on how do we empower young people to become change agents in their community? How do we help them think about literacy in ways that oftentimes is not presented to them within the context of school? Part of what we have to recognize is that if we have systems in place that are not working, we have to be determined to identify models that are working. And I want to highlight one model that I think is having some tremendous impact on our young people, freedom schools. So they've been in place across the country for the past 30 years. But part of what the freedom schools decided to do this year was to locate themselves in the probation camps. So how do we take this model that has a focus on literacy, a focus on civic engagement, a focus on intergenerational development, and how do we locate it with our forgotten population? young boys and girls who find themselves in juvenile detention camps. So they have basically four key components to what they do with regard to the curriculum. They start each day off with the Harambe. A Harambe is a, is a pull together time and for about a half an hour, students come together and engage in cheers and chants and, and talk about sort of their purpose and focus for the day. And they really kind of get themselves excited for learning because they talk about the importance of their role in their lives and they're around other people who are helping them to lift them up and not beat them down. Each day starts off that way. Then they have an integrated reading curriculum. The whole focus is on literacy development, where we help, we help these young people who are already behind academically, give them the kind of support where they begin to see how they can begin to develop reading skills. But what's important here is that the Freedom School model says that there's a reason why many of our young people don't engage in reading, because what they're being asked to read does not connect to their realities. So one of the key staples of the Freedom School model is to bring in culturally relevant content. So student read, students read about items and issues and history that are tied to their own sets of experience. When students get to read about things that are relevant to them, levels of interest and engagement go up. Okay? Then they've got what's called DEAR, drop everything and read. Right? Right before lunch, scholars and staff drop everything and you read for 30 minutes. So again, part of what we have to understand is that we have labeled certain students as being problem children. We demonize them, but we don't demonize the structure that they find themselves in. And what we have found with the Freedom Schools model is that when you put students in a humanizing space that affirms students, that gives them the support, the kind of behavior that we see is problematic in school, we don't see them in the Freedom Schools because the framework is different. So I will stress to my beginning teachers, the single most important thing that you can do as beginning educators is you can build relationships with your students. The single most important thing, once you build relationships with your students, 
it will take you a long way because now young people know that you care. If you care for me, I will do what you ask. If you care for me, I will put forth effort. If you care about me, I'll do everything in my power to be the best student that I can be. And the Freedom School model is based on care, based on relationships, based on young people feeling as if the adults that they're going to interact with in their classrooms every single day have their best interests at heart. So there's respectful treatment of the youth. They refer to every day throughout the program as scholars, okay? Scholars, how do we start to put in young people's minds that we see you as being something bigger than anybody else could have ever told you you could become? I always tell the story, when I was younger, my mother didn't go to college, right? But she always told my brother and I that we would go to college. And she would always say, when you go to college, when you go to college, when you go to college. Do you know what happens when you have somebody who tells you that almost every day? What starts to happen? You go to college, right? I just thought, I thought college was like the 13th grade. I just thought everybody knew, right? My mother always talked about when you go to college. And part of what we have to recognize is that at the end of the day, we are the products of other people's expectations. Okay? I'll say that one more time. We are the products of everybody, we are the products of other people's expectations. Nobody is here by accident. Somebody somewhere helped you believe that this reality would become what it is. And part of what we're finding in freedom schools is that it changes the entire dynamic of a learning community. When you have individuals who are in there who are excited about you being there, who want you to be there, who encourage you, who affirm you, who lift their expectations for you. And this is the kind of environment that we should have each and every student walking into every single day, but unfortunately it does not happen. So CDF Freedom Schools are in probation camp. We experimented with this last summer uh, with two sites. And I'm going to walk you through what we did in those sites. Part of what you see is that Martin Haberman talks about what a pedagogy of plenty looks like, where you have authentic tags, you have a meaning-driven curriculum, where you have a literacy-rich environment, right? All these things that Haberman talks about, where you have problem-focused learning, where you have cognitive and metacognitive uh, uh, learning within the, within the context of purposeful activity. When students can think, plan, build, debate, do research, right? This is what real learning should be about, where they collaborate on issues that matter to them, right? And they start to examine why are there such high levels of incarceration in black and brown communities. That's something that they want to study. Why are crime rates higher in certain communities compared to others, right? Where they engage in substantive dialogues that are, around, that are around issues that make meaning in their own day-to-day -day lives. So part of what you will see in the Freedom School model is a pedagogy of plenty, where young people get to think about, write about, explore issues that are important to them, but they do so within the context of literacy, within the context of social action, within the context of mathematics development, right? So you have students engaging in the process of developing academically, but they do so because they are able to take on real life issues. Students are telling us every single day that schools are flat out boring. You don't stimulate us. You don't allow us to be creative. You don't allow us to be innovative, right? And therefore, we don't want to do this thing called school the way you do, okay? So, in the Freedom School model, part of what I'm going to show you is that we have uh, survey data where we have collected pre and post surveys from our scholars. Uh, these are young men between the ages of 13 and 16. Uh, where we looked at sort of what they said about the program, what worked, what didn't work for them. We also engaged in a number of focus groups with them because part of what we have to understand is that we have to begin to put models in place that provide different ways of doing schooling, but in some ways we have to show that within the traditional measures that these programs still work. I say that because oftentimes we have programs that work and you ask folks, well, how do you know that it works? and most of the feedback is anecdotal, right? Which is important, which is rich, but if we want these to be sustainable kinds of models, we have to have a multitude in terms of the types of data that we have. So what you see here are some of the responses that some of the young scholars gave us, right? Uh, and these are some young men who are some of the most intelligent young people you ever want to meet. Uh, here's one young man who talked about his reading. He said, when I first got to Camp Miller, I wasn't into reading, so when I came here, it's like I'm just gonna sit here and just do my time and not do nothing. So I started reading books, like two books in one day. So I started reading more books. And basically, reading books, that's what I do now. I'm into it. We started seeing a love for reading that many of these young people said that they never would have had before they came here, right? So part of what we have to understand is that young people will read when we give them something that's worthy of reading, right? Uh, and these were the kind of comments that were talked about throughout 
our data collection, right? Young men who said that, you know what, school is just not giving me anything that I'm interested in. I come here, I get to read about things that are culturally and socially relevant, things that make me think, things that make me wonder, things that make me reflect, things that make me angry because now I understand why my family has gone through the circumstances that it has gone through. Now I understand how I'm part of the whole sort of, sort of you know, problem that's coming within our community, how I can help to change that. You see young men thinking critically in ways that they had not within the context of their own school. Uh, so you see here another young man talks about, well, I really didn't go to school at all. So it's like everything I do here, I wish I could have done before. Because then I wouldn't have to go through this ever again. Like, you know, when I came, I was, I don't know, I didn't know how to spell that much. I didn't know how to read that good, so I didn't know how to write it all. So it's like freedom school is kind of improving everything that I know how to do. Uh, it is just affirming to hear young people who are so disengaged from school now all of a sudden find a purpose to find a passion, to find a place where they feel like I get to become self-actualized. And this is a model we have to figure out how do we replicate in all of our public schools. Uh, Harambe, this is one of the things that we found kind of interesting, right? So Harambe is this big celebration that they get to engage in every day. So, you know, one of the young men said, so you know, gangsters don't play soccer, gangsters don't dance and all that. So they just first started Harambe, everybody's just standing around like, what the is this, right? <laughs> Then after a while, you just get into it. And now you have all these gangsters jumping, singing, and coming together. I love them all. Right? So this is the beauty of it. Even the gangsters got into this, right? Because they saw that, and so like, here's what we have to understand. For a lot of our young people, they see, they see learning as having to compromise their own cultural integrity. Do I choose culture or do I choose schools? And if they have to choose between culture and schools, they're going to choose culture every single day of the week, right? But in these spaces here, culture and schools were one and the same. And so over time, these young men began to realize that, you know what, I can be here, I can still be hard, I can still be me, and I can still do the thing called learning, and that is what is transformative about certain spaces, okay? Uh, unity, right? So here's where one of the unexpected outcomes were. In LA, there's a lot of different kinds of tension between black and brown gangs, and, and a lot of the detention camps kind of keep them segregated because they don't want fighting that happens there. But here's what one of the young men said. He said, he said it bonds like before, it was kind of like a race thing, like the blacks with the blacks, the Mexicans with the Mexicans, the whites, some whites would go with the whites. But what happened since Freedom School started, you've been seeing more combined stuff, like playing basketball and stuff. So what we saw was much more integration across racial and ethnic lines because these young people were reading texts that talked about the history of segregation that talked about the ways in which class-based kinds of uh, policy began to sort of redline and separate out communities. So these young men, for the first time, started thinking, wow, and now I see why I claim I don't like him, despite the fact that he and I have much more in common than we have that's different, right? This is what learning should be about, when young people are thinking critically about their own environments and their own circumstances and realizing that we shouldn't be divided, we need to be united in how we think about the circumstances that we face every day. So now, Part of what the model is about is how we move from a punitive <coughs> approach to a restorative approach. Again, part of the way we disrupt the school to prison pipeline is that we cannot punish children. We have to give them a chance to have restorative justice, right? So here, within the model of freedom schools, it's about moving away from thinking self to how do we think of others. And in the freedom school model, young people would talk about their behavior and why they did it and what it may have meant to the community. And, get, and have the opportunity to talk to people who they may have harmed, and have those people explain how they felt and why they felt the way that they did. Have the young people who were the so-called perpetrators then begin to offer apologies and give them a course of restoration and not punitive action, right? So then they don't have to justify their actions, right? They get to recognize the extent of the harm that they caused. This is how we rebuild young people, by giving them a second chance. This is about redemption, right? Part of what we find in the camp is that there is no opportunity for redemption, and this is why young people continue to be angry and then recommit and reoffend the same kinds of offenses, right? So instead of them becoming the victim, right, we help them become accountable, right? So understand that you have to be able to own up to your own behavior, right? And understand the circumstances that may have resulted in your behavior. And then how do we fix the behavior so it doesn't happen a second or third time, right? So here, we're not trying to have them blame others, but accept responsibility. And in the Freedom School model, there were, there, were, there were small group meetings where young people were very much forthcoming. They could become vulnerable. They could express themselves emotionally. Part of what we have to understand is this. There are some very distorted notions of masculinity within our society. And many of our young men have bought in full 
hook and sinker to those distorted notions of masculinity, right? And so part of what we have to do is help to push back on how they define what it means to be man, what it means to be sort of, you know, strong, what it means to be hard, what it means to be responsible. All these things are talked about and examined within the context of the principal model. So instead of excluding them from the community and marginalizing young people, we're including them in the community and we're integrating them on a regular basis, right? Part of what we do in school is if you mess up, we push you out and you can't come back in until there's been three, four, five days later. We don't give you an opportunity to express your regret for what you did or why you did it. So therefore, some of the young people who left the school angry, guess what? They come back angrier, right? And some of them say, the teacher who had it out for me doesn't realize what I'm going to do when I get back. There's a, there's a wonderful little book I think all beginning teachers should read, right? It's called I Won't Learn From You by Herbert Cole, K-O-H-A. And in that book, what Herbert Cole talks about is the ways in which these young people that he interviewed talk about how they deliberately make the choice to not learn from certain teachers. And when he asks them why they choose not to learn from certain teachers, it's very simple. They don't care, they're not supportive, they don't recognize their own prior knowledge. And so these students therefore decide, because you don't recognize me as a person, I'm not going to hear, I'm not going to recognize you as a person. And I'm going to choose to consciously not learn from you, right? And some of them go as far as saying, not only will I not learn from you, I will sabotage this entire classroom to ensure that nobody else learns from you as well, right? How many folks have seen that student in action, right? <laughs> Every hand goes up, right? So part of what we have to understand, this is about relationship building. It's about engagement. It's about rapport. It's about being empathetic, understanding our cir the circumstances of our students, not lowering expectations, but expecting them to be something bigger than what we oftentimes say that they can become. So this is the model. How do we move away from being punitive to being restorative, right? And the Freedom School's model is big on restoration big on accountability, big on recognizing your behavior and in including you as part of the community. So some of the data we have that shows that, look, students who said they would read at least three to four times a week, on the pre, they were 56, about half. On the flip side, about 6% said that they would read more. Um, but what we're encouraged by is the fact that 85% said that they intend to continue reading weekly, right? That's, a, that's, that's something you can build upon. You have young people who said that now I found a love for learning, a love for reading, and I want to keep doing it more and more because I see if I read about things that deal with issues around <coughs> oppression, that deal with issues around equity, I am somehow expanding my mind and I can become a change agent in my community. Uh, their attitudes and beliefs about reading, right? 6% report that they're better readers now because of what they got from the freedom school, right? Their attitudes towards reading have increased. This is the model we have to find ways to expand and incorporate into schools all across our country. I'm not a big test person, believe you me. I have issues with what we do with tests, but part of what we have to do is part of this arrangement, we have to put these assessments in place. If you look at the results here, they tell us a story. It said that even on the traditional measures, you look at Camp Afterball, where we had reading scores that were 648, and this is a seven week program seven-week program, what we see is that there's a 60-point increase after seven weeks, right? So student scores in terms of comprehension increase, vocabulary increase, uh, dissecting text increase. Same thing at Camp Miller, you see the increase in, in scores. So part of what we're saying is that the students are not only reporting to us how much the, the, the program makes a difference for their, in their lives, but also the data bears out the fact that they are more engaged readers. They are comprehending better. They're wanting to read. These are the things that you cannot dismiss, right? If you start to have young people early on responding this way, you give them a much viable chance, much more viable chance of being successful in life. So we are encouraged and pleased by what we're seeing with these results. And then you see some behavior here. So I just look at what's in the red here, right? Part of what these camps have faced over and over again are incidents of violence in the camps. And because they are stressed in Freedom School that this is about how we work collaboratively, how we're a community. You see the number of school referrals and suspensions. We see a slight decrease that happened in Camp Miller, which is the top location here. Uh, but we were really encouraged by what we saw in Camp Afterball, where we saw a significant drop in the number of suspensions and referrals. Because part of this is how do you give teachers the skills and the tools to be able to deal with students who have a host of challenges, right? Part of what we see in every school across this country, that some teachers are able to deal with students that other teachers are afraid of, right? 
So what is it that teacher A is able to do that he or she keeps students in that classroom, keeps them engaged, keeps them doing work, but student B, I mean, but teacher B can't keep that student for more than 10, 15 minutes in the classroom. So part of what we have to understand is that the Freedom School model, in many ways, is trying to help teachers acquire the tools necessary to engage students, rapport with students. These things make a huge difference. So let me show you a little bit of the Freedom Schools now. I'm going to show you a brief clip here so you kind of get a sense firsthand from what these young people do on a regular basis. Short clip, but I think it gives you a little bit of flavor for how they see their experience. 